Welcome to a special episode of Steampunk Physics. Today we're going to be talking about the physics of UAPs, but more specifically we're going to be talking about the crack at the heart of physics that allows these objects to perform maneuvers that are theoretically against the laws of physics. But in fact, it's actually just because we have a belief at the very heart of physics that is nothing but pure pseudoscience. Stay tuned. So if you're familiar with my channel, then you probably know I enjoy steampunk and speculative fiction, but you probably also know I like to treat the subject of physics uh, from a historical pers perspective, which is why uh, steampunk is my preferred um, carrier, I suppose. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Deep in the history of physics, there is a carte blanche sort of decision that was made that is not based on any empirical evidence. So let me say that again. There is a belief at the heart of physics, modern accepted theoretical physics, that is without any evidence and is therefore completely pseudoscience. This idea has been taken as just pure fact for over a century. Let's back this up. So here is what Google says pseudoscience is a collection of beliefs or practices mistakenly regarded as being based on scientific method. Well, then what is scientific method? Here's the Google definition for that. A method of procedure that has characterized natural science since the 17th century, consisting in systematic observation, measurement, and experiment, and the formulation, testing, and modification of hypotheses. So this means that for something to have been part of the scientific method, it has to have been tested by experiment. I said that modern physics is based on pseudoscience, and I meant it because there is a belief that has no testing, and it is directly in the dead center of theoretical physics. It's everything from theoretical physics comes from this point, so perhaps this is where we'll start unraveling the mystery of the UAPs. That concept is called Minkowski space-time, and some people believe that by its very nature, it can never be tested. So therefore, will forever remain within the realm of pseudoscience. Now let's get into the details because I know there's some people who want to. They're already down there in the comments going away, but uh, let's get into it. The claim I'm making is based upon the history of relativity that has been forgotten. So let me read you a quote. Einstein starts from the hypothesis that the laws will look the same to all observers in uniform motion. This permits a very concise and elegant formulation of the theory, as often happens when one big assumption can be made to cover several less big ones. But in my opinion, there is also something to be said for taking students along the road made by Fitzgerald, Larmor, Lorentz, and Poincaré. The longer road sometimes gives more familiarity with the country. That's a quote by John Stuart Bell of the Bell Inequalities. So what he's referring to here is that there are multiple interpretations of relativity, just like there are multiple interpretations of quantum mechanics. And specifically that people should be taught these multiple interpretations. Unfortunately, nobody heeded Bell's advice and it is completely lost to most students today. Most professors today don't even know this part of history. So what is this alternative interpretation of relativity theory? It's based upon ether. There is a relativistic ether. And the funny thing is that there was actually a priority dispute where some people suggested that the relativistic ether theory should have been given primacy over the modern relative theory. So what we have here are two different versions of a theory that have the same mathematical outcome, but they have radically different ways of interpreting what's going on with reality. So this is just like in quantum mechanics. There's multiple interpretations that are equally valid. And I'm saying there is an ether theory and there was an ether theory. The pinnacle of ether theory was actually completely equivalent to modern relativistic theory, but it's a different interpretation, just like there's different interpretations of quantum mechanics. Quickly recapping, what I'm saying here is that there are two versions of relativity, 
one of them being based on ether and that ether and relativity are not in conflict but there is a relativity theory that is based on ether and in fact it was the first relativity theory it came before einstein's and used the same math it's called the lorentz transform or the lorentz factor so these are the things that are forgotten and mostly unknown even in modern physics books and classrooms so there is only one way to distinguish between these two versions of relativity, one based on ether and the one based on Minkowski space-time. And that is called a one-way speed of light experiment. And that has never been done. Now, I say it's never been done, but I don't actually believe that. That's the consensus idea that it's never been done. And in fact, there's a video I'll link in the low bar from Veritasium. Derek does a great job of explaining this, and he says that the speed of light cannot be measured in one direction. So that's where I was talking about how Minkowski space-time can never move from pseudoscience into the realm of science because there's no experiment to differentiate the earlier theory that is based upon a uh, hundred years of science from this newer version of the same theory because that's what Minkowski space-time is is a newer version of ether theory it was the ether theory that led to the math of relativity and that is not under dispute now personally I would argue that a one-way speed of light test has been done and it came out in favor of the ether and as a matter of fact that there have been numerous experiments that have done that but that's a video for a different time you can check out all my other work on that however what we're talking about here is whether or not the basis of modern physics is pseudoscience and i'm just trying to explain to you exactly how it is that you can explain to others and understand yourself that there are two alternative versions and that there's no empirical evidence for space-time and what space-time is is important here understanding that Minkowski decided to join space with time that's a brand new idea that's never been come up with before and that idea represents something particular about the way the universe works that there's an additional dimension that space and time are linked is very important and it has to do with the constancy of light so now it's going to start to get a little more technical and we're going to continue to explain these things but the important thing to remember here is that minkowski space-time has not been proven empirically it's an idea and it's an idea that is pseudoscience because it has not been tested it has not been proven so ideas of time travel the einstein rosen bridge so many of these things are based upon Minkowski space-time. Therefore, they too are also pseudoscience because they are based upon something that has no empirical evidence. So let me explain how it is though that it can come to a lot of right answers. So, cause what I'm saying here is that we've chosen something that is a wrong answer. And if you know about science, that there's so much about relativity, et cetera, that works. So how is it that something that works could in any way be wrong. Let me explain. There's a favorite story I like to tell about how natives in Papua New Guinea are able to perform something that is like an experiment. And this is the story of the fishing tree is what I call it. And what happens is these natives, they go and they perform a, a ceremony and they are able to pray and sing to the spirit of the fishing tree and the fishing tree gives them fish you can go there you can watch them do it and it will happen but the problem is they have procedures that work when their ideas about what those procedures are doing are wrong so it is replicable and in a way it's scientific why how is it working how is it that fish are actually coming when they just perform some some sacred rite to invoke the spirit of the fishing tree well, it just so happens that along with all the singing and praying and things like that, they beat a root into the water and that root has a neurotoxin in it. And that neurotoxin is only toxic to the fish and not to the humans. So what they've done is something that is replicable. That's part of this whole story. And if you were to try to explain to them that the spirit of the fishing tree doesn't exist, they would get very angry at you and say that they've seen it a million times in their life and it can't possibly be wrong. They have 
evidence. They have proof. They see the way that they can design their life around and their survival around this idea of the spirit of the fishing tree. But it's wrong, isn't it? Or is it? It's sort of wrong. And that's my point about how our knowledge in science can be sort of wrong and also still be able to allow us to design things that work. This is a very strange concept. This is a very strange thing that is kind of new to a lot of people. So don't be you know, surprised if this is the first time you've really thought about this. Most people haven't thought about this idea of truth within limits, that you can have an idea that is true to a certain extent, but it's not quite as true as another idea, is it? Because they can, I suppose they could extend this idea of the fishing tree to other ways of getting food. So it could be the food tree because they could burn the root and then the neurotoxin might actually affect bees and then they could get honey. So they could even extend their idea. But how far could they extend it? Not very far. If they tried to burn the root to catch some water buffalo, they'd probably get run over. However, you can see how there is a way of extending something that isn't quite true because it's kind of close to the truth you can still extend it a little bit but you can't extend it very far that's the difference between a truth within limits and something that is more true our ideas that are based upon the idea of neurotoxin for instance we would be able to take this chemical and apply it to you know some sort of pain relief thing or some sort of problem with neuralgia we could uh, you make some sort of medicine that would work for those things so you can see that there's a truth within limits aspect here that we're talking about. And this is the way we can actually have a revolution in physics, understanding that we have things that allowed us to design and allowed us to come to good working principles that were basically an analogy to the truth. Not quite true, but doggone close, right? So... This is the way that we can actually have a revolution. This is the way that we can start to see some small places where we could still have been right all this time, right in a certain way, and also have been wrong at the same time. That's how we could have these things breaking the laws of physics. Breaking the laws of physics? Maybe those laws were just a misinterpretation of the data. Maybe we could even design things based on our ideas and them not quite be right. So now without getting too technical, let's quickly get into how is it that Minkowski space-time and the ether version of relativity, how are they the same thing mathematically? Now this is actually well known that when Poincaré and Lorentz, it was actually Poincaré published some corrections is what it was called to Lorentz's work. And because, because Einstein was working on the same thing, he was working on the electrodynamical part, both Poincaré and Einstein were extending Lorentz's work. And Lorentz's work was basically the change factor that is at the heart of relativity. So it comes down to what does it mean? Well, Einstein just said, well, we don't need to think about the, uh, about the ether. However, Lorentz designed that math that Einstein used specifically to describe an illusion. So it's an illusion that is modeled mathematically that Lorentz designed the, the change factor and the Lorentz transform, all of that is specifically to model an illusion that the ether performs. Now, a lot of people are going to say, well, we got rid of the ether because we had to believe in this illusion sort of thing. Well, the illusion was just that objects were shortened. That's still in relativity. But with Minkowski space-time, we also have to buy into this idea that the universe, a single moment of time in the universe, is four-dimensional. That's a promotion of reality. And it hints at infinite additional realities. So when they say that they got rid of something by got, getting rid of the ether, that's not true. We didn't use Occam's razor to get rid of ether. We instead added infinite additional realities. And so that is where the difference between Minkowski space-time and relativistic ether is very difficult to understand. And I'm not going to get into too many of the details here because I have other videos for that. But just bear in mind that in one case, we decide that there is a, there is a layer that is hidden from us that is just simply 
hard to get at and that we could get at with a one-way speed of light experiment if we could figure out how to do that and that's very difficult to do but in the other paradigm what we do is we decide that there is this additional thing to reality where that where light is this special aspect of the universe and that the universe has all this additional stuff in it that is never been seen and behaviors that have never been un, you know experienced before we can come to the same conclusion with ether the same mathematical conclusion just by accepting the idea that things shorten which is in relativity and not have to buy into all of this additional stuff we can have a simpler conclusion that exposes more information. There is actually more information available that is useful in the ether for version of relativity. But instead, we chose Minkowski space-time, and we made this choice without any evidence. And there's never been, according to those people who favor relativity, there's never been a one-way speed of light test ever performed according to me and a lot of other people however there have been one-way speed of light tests performed that have just been rejected because it went against people's favorite idea a favorite idea that basically they ignored the evidence to falsify it so it is pseudoscience minkowski space-time is pseudoscience and now we finally have some way in which we can see our version of physics to be working and allow us to design things but still somehow be wrong and allow this breaking the laws of physics because how else how else could objects be breaking the laws of physics if they're really actually laws we have to have misunderstood something this is the first place where we can say for sure there is a crack in the foundation of physics in which this breaking of the laws of physics will actually make sense. So, finally, the most uh, well-accepted version of how these things might be performing what they do is through uh, concepts like the Alcubierre drive. Now, those are called space-time engineering um, papers, I suppose. It's uh, Hal Putoff had a paper that was called Space-Time, uh, Advanced Space Propulsion on, on Vacuum Space-Time Metric Engineering is what it's uh, called. But these papers are based upon Minkowski space-time, and that's why some of these things seem to still be at the very edges of what could be possible, and they seem to be nonsensical in certain ways. However, if the vacuum is instead the ether, and we start to have these additional degrees of freedom that would be there in something that behaves like a superfluid, then suddenly a whole new door opens for us to explain these things. And the ideas of vacuum engineering and things like that start to make a lot more sense. They start to actually have a basis that will work. So here you have finally a way in which we can describe a new way of viewing the universe that still fits with all modern physics accomplishments but can throw away some of the interpretations throw away some of the ideas that may be stopping us from understanding how it is that these objects could be traveling in ways that break the laws of physics they simply weren't, aren't laws thanks for joining me and i hope that you'll make sure to tell your friends that minkowski space-time is pure pseudoscience and that you've joined me in the neoclassical revolution and we're going to understand how these new things and new phenomena actually work take care